are your eyes? Ah, better. But that's not actually what I mean. I'm talking about what you pay attention to as you go through your day. Do you see that candy wrapper on the sidewalk? The dishwasher that needs to be unloaded? What about the toy lying in the middle of the floor that someone is definitely gonna trip over? Do your eyes pay attention to the kid playing alone on the playground? Or your older neighbor trying to wheel her trash bin up the driveway? All around you, there are things that need to be done, just waiting for someone to step up. And that someone can be you. When you see that piece of trash, toss it in the can. Take that silverware and slide it in the drawer. Pick up that toy and put it away. Invite that kid to join your kickball team and offer to help your neighbor get her rolling bin back to the house. When you see a need and you make a move to take care of it, that's initiative. It's a great way to show love to the people around you. When you see what needs to be done and do it, others can see God at work in you. That's why initiative is an amazing way to worship God with your life. Because worship is about more than just singing loud. It's all about living loud. Help me God to see what you see. You are doing a great work in me. I've decided I can stand still. No, you have given me purpose All my, all my heart is yours All my, all my life is yours I will, I will make a move for you For you All my, all my heart is yours To serve you. serve you You have given me a job to do I wanna love the world just like you, yeah You have given me purpose All my, all my heart is yours All my, all my life is yours Jacob! Oh, there it is. That's how I... Nope, that's not it, Jacob. Okay. Okay. Nope, it's back on again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I am ready for lunch. I mean, 
Not really. I don't actually have a rocket or anything. But I am ready for initiative. Initiative is seeing what needs to be done and doing it. Astronauts are really great at showing initiative. When they see what needs to be done, they don't just ignore it. They do something about it. They even have this thing they do before every launch. It's called a status check. And it works like this. Rocket fuel, check. Oh. Rocket fuel is a go. Red switchy thing, check. Red switchy thing, huh? Red switchy thing is a go. Power thrusters, check. Power thrusters. Power thrusters are a gross. I can't check, I can't check the power thrusters because somebody left a dirty sock here. Well, can you move the dirty sock? I mean, I could, yes, but it's not mine. I didn't leave it here. And so I don't think it's my job to move the sock. I suggest that we halt the launch until whoever left this sock here comes and gets it themselves. Copy that. Holding launch for a dirty sock. Good. Roger that. I wonder how long I'm gonna have to wait for someone to come get this sock. Probably gonna be here for a while. You know what? Today's story is about a guy who saw something that needed to be done, and he did something about it, even though it wasn't his responsibility. Sounds like a great guy. Will somebody come get this sock? It smells. Some people, am I right? Ugh. The Bible, it's 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how he created us and loves us so much that he made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. Now, for an amazing story, inspired by the book of Nehemiah, chapters 1 and 2. Over and over, the Israelites promised to be faithful to God, but over and over again, they turned away from Him. At last, God allowed enemy armies to take His people captive and carry them off to Babylon, nearly a thousand miles away. After 70 years, God allowed some of his people to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. But back in Babylon, now part of Persia, the rest of the Jews had made lives for themselves. In fact, a Jew named Nehemiah had become quite important. Greetings. I am cupbearer to the king. A cupbearer was like a bodyguard who checked to make sure that no one poisoned the king's food or drink. Nehemiah was likely a trusted advisor. Your Majesty. May I suggest the date pudding? But though it was nearly 150 years since the Israelites had left Jerusalem, Nehemiah's heart was still in his homeland. When his brother Hanani returned from his trip to Judah, Nehemiah had a chance for some news. Brother, how are the people left in Jerusalem? Some are still alive, but they're having a hard time. Oh no. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. The gates have been burned with fire. People are ashamed. That's terrible. A city without walls could never prosper. The people would always live in fear of being attacked. I'm sorry to bring such bad news. No, no, uh, I'm glad you told me. This made Nehemiah sat down and wept. He couldn't even eat for several days. Instead, he poured his heart out to God. Lord, you are a great and wonderful God. See how your people are suffering. Please listen to me. I'm praying for the people of Israel. We Israelites have committed sins against you. We haven't obeyed the commands you gave to Moses. Nehemiah reminded God of the promise he made to his people. You said, if you people are not faithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me, I will bring you back. Lord, please pay careful attention to my prayer. Give me success when I bring my request to King Artaxerxes. For four whole months, Nehemiah prayed daily to God. He knew before taking action, he needed to listen and prepare. At last, he was ready. Your Majesty. Anyone who came before the king was supposed to appear happy. But for the first time, Nehemiah allowed his true feelings to show. Oh, why are you looking so sad? 
May you live forever? Why shouldn't I look sad? The city of my people has been destroyed, and fire has burned up its gates. The king could have been annoyed and ordered Nehemiah to be punished, but God moved his heart. Well, what do you want? Nehemiah prayed silently for the right words. Send me to Judah. Let me go to the city of Jerusalem. I want to rebuild it. The king frowned and glanced over at the queen. At last he said, hmm. How long will your journey take? When will you get back? Precisely as many moons as are required. Fair enough. Dismissed. Nehemiah turned to leave, but he knew there was more he needed for the job. If it pleases you, may I take some letters with me? I want to give them to the governors west of the Euphrates River. Then they'll help me to travel safely. Mm, done. Oh, and a letter to the caretaker of the royal park? So he'll give me logs for the wall and gates and a house? <laughs> what next? A whole escort of army officers and horsemen? That would be fantastic. Fine. All of it. Get on with it. God had given Nehemiah such favor with the king that he had everything he needed for his long journey to Judah. At last, Nehemiah had reached the city he dreamt of his entire life. Jerusalem. Though Nehemiah was overjoyed by the first glimpse of the city, it must have been difficult to see its crumbling, broken down walls. So much work to be done. But Nehemiah didn't tell anyone his plan at first. On a bright moonlit night, Nehemiah snuck out with only a few others to see the full damage to the walls. We have to know what we're up against. Nehemiah traveled by donkey. With a few trusted friends, they left the city through the broken valley gate. Let's head toward the Jackal Well. At last, Nehemiah got a clear picture of the devastation. Jagged piles of rock lay everywhere. The gates were gone with scorched gaping holes in their place. It's such a big job. Only God can do this. Nehemiah circled what was left of the wall heading up the Kidron Valley and at last returning through the Valley Gate. The next morning, he called together the priests and nobles and officials. You know I've come to visit my people in Jerusalem, but that's not the only reason I'm here. Nehemiah gestured to the jagged remains of the wall, visible from where they stood. You can see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem has been destroyed. Fire has burned up its gates. Tell us something new. Come on. Let's rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. Then people won't be ashamed anymore. Hmm, well, I mean, that's something to consider if you think about this. Our grandparents tried that years ago. But God has been helping me. He gave me favor with the king. He'll help us complete the work. So who's in? Well, me. I'm in. Me too. Let's start rebuilding. God moved the hearts of the people to help Nehemiah, and together they began the gigantic job of repairing the walls and gates of Jerusalem. You ever see a piece of trash on the ground and just walk by without picking it up because you didn't put it there? Or maybe someone didn't clean up after themselves when dinner was over. Do you just leave the messy dishes lying around? Do you ignore someone else's dirty sock? A lot of people see what needs to be done, but then don't do it because it's not their job. It's not their responsibility, but showing initiative means getting things done, not waiting for someone else to do it. That's what Nehemiah did when he started rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. It's what Jesus did too. When he saw a need, he did something about it. He healed people who needed healing. He taught people who needed to learn. And Jesus took care of our greatest need when he died on the cross for our sins. So, if you wanna show initiative, don't just see what needs to be done, do something about it. Do a status check. Do you see any dirty dishes? Dirty dishes? Oh! Dirty dishes, cleared away. Check. Do you see any trash? Water bottle? Recycled. Check. Do you see a dirty sock? Dirty socks cleared away, even though it's not my job. Check. 
Here's the one thing to remember today. Don't wait for someone else to do what needs to be done. Initiative takes a lot of work for sure, but it's worth it. It helps you, it helps other people, and it helps the world. And maybe, just maybe, it can help the universe. I'll see you next time.